Hey everybody, welcome back to an all new episode of Tend to Life with me, Annie Elise. I hope you guys are doing good today. We, well today, mm, grammar police, sorry, I hope you're doing well today. Um, we're talking about a love story gone wrong today and a love story that's pretty complex, had some craziness and kind of the new age craziness because I feel like these days it almost feels like more couples meet online than in more of the traditional ways, right? Whether somebody is looking for a real relationship or maybe just a one night stand, it feels like dating apps can pretty much give anybody whatever they want, just a simple swipe. That is assuming that everybody is being honest on the apps. But as we all know, people can lie on these apps. People can catfish. People can do all sorts of crazy shit. Maybe they might shave off a few years of their age. Maybe shave off a few pounds, whatever they're doing. Or maybe they don't even use a picture that doesn't look like what they look like. Like a catfish, something like that. And then sometimes people lie about even bigger things. Like whether or not they're really single or not. Or how serious of a relationship they're actually looking for. Which I gotta say, like, why lie? Just go on Ashley Madison, right? But anyways, in today's case, we're talking about two women who connected on an app. But then one of them told a ton of lies. And basically, every single thing she said wasn't true. And what was supposed to then be a fun one-night stand, it ended with a police standoff. Buckle up, guys. Let's jump right in. All right, guys, you know I keep it real with you. I'll tell you what's going on. I'll be honest. I'll be vulnerable. And lately, I've been getting a little bit more self-conscious about my face, about my skin, feeling like it's getting a little bit dull. I was actually even considering doing some research into injectables. Hello, I live in Orange County after all. But then I found this skincare supplement, Hyacera from Ritual. And this has been an absolute game changer for me, guys, because Hyacere is a once daily skin supplement that is clinically proven to reduce wrinkles and fine lines and improve skin smoothness. Ever since I started taking Hyacere, I feel like my skin looks way more smooth. It feels so much more hydrated. Plus, I feel like it looks way more glowy. Not only do I see a difference too, but Hyacere's results are clinically proven. Hyacere takes your skincare to a deeper level because it works from the inside out. And let me just show you guys these because I brought them from my house because I want you to see what they look like. It's one capsule daily, and it can be taken any time of the day with or without food. It's also subscription-based, which I love because then you never run out, and I've learned that consistency is absolutely key and crucial when you're taking a probiotic or a gut supplement. So you guys need to check it out. It has helped me tremendously. I am absolutely in love. So for 25% off your first order of Ritual, go to ritual.com slash 10 to life or scan the QR code on the screen. And thank you, Ritual, for sponsoring today's video and for keeping my skin smooth and glowy fresh. So let's go back to 2021, and we are going to be talking about 36-year-old Heidi Kathleen Carter. She had very long, dark, straight hair, thin eyebrows, brown striking eyes. She lived in Evansville, Indiana, which is a bigger city. It has a population of around 115,000 people, and it's way down by the border where Kentucky is. And even with its bigger size, it's actually a relatively safe place to live. The schools also make it a pretty desirable place to live, especially if you're looking for more of that suburban laid-back lifestyle. Now, Heidi was a boy mom. She was a mother with some boys, and I couldn't find a ton of information out about her children and who the father was, but at least one of her kids was a teenager, and Heidi also didn't seem to have full custody over them. And that might have been because she was kind of the type of person who was in and out of jobs, relationships, and just about everything else. Her life had kind of been a little bit of a mess for years, and the mess included problems with the law, like how in the fall of 2017, she was over at a friend's house with her dog. When the friend didn't shut the front door, Heidi's dog escaped, which made her so mad and mad enough that she began punching her friend in the face multiple times. Then, after taking off, she actually came back to the house and she broke down the bedroom door to get at her friend one more time, who was now completely hiding from her. Just a little bit unhinged, right? Not like your typical traditional response to your dog walking out the front yard. 
Now, finally, the police arrived at this scene, but Heidi was apparently still mad about this situation because even after the police handcuffed her and were trying to get her into the van, Heidi was trying to kick them, like kicking and screaming, trying to fight the cops now. So for all of that, she ended up being put in jail for 54 days. However, she apparently didn't learn her lesson because the very next year, Heidi was once again arrested on domestic battery and she was sentenced to a year in jail this time. She ended up taking a plea deal, and she only had to be in jail for 13 days, so all in all, I'd say she kind of got off pretty easy. But I think it's safe to assume that her run-ins with the law were at least part of the reason why she didn't have custody over her children. But with all of that being said, Heidi was now working hard to get her life back on track, get her life in order, less messy, less chaotic. She had a lot of different types of jobs all throughout her life, including working as a car detailer, um, a repossessor at a repo shop, things like that. But then around the time that COVID began, she was a bit down on her luck. Luckily, though, a friend of hers named Jason Harvey felt really bad for her and decided to invite her to come live with him. Heidi was living in a motel at the time, and Jason said that she could stay on the bottom floor of a house. He lived on the top floor with his two teenage kids. So the house itself was kind of like a duplex situation, that kind of setup, with two separate entrances. And Stinson Avenue was a very quiet and peaceful street to live on for the most part, so it was almost like the perfect place for Heidi to just reinvent herself, to figure out what was going to be next in her life. And she was also thrilled to get out of that crummy, crappy motel that she was staying at and finally now be at a comfortable place. So in or around 2021, that's exactly what she did. Jason seemed nice, seemed trustworthy, and the whole situation was pretty much exactly what Heidi needed. She even bonded with Jason's two kids who really liked her, and she was overall a good tenant as well. But Jason ended up having one problem with her. And it was that a lot of the time she had her boyfriend over at the house. Her boyfriend was 46-year-old Carrie David Hammond. And whenever he would be over, they would fight. A lot. And Jason could hear all of the arguments, all of the fighting. Now, this also wasn't some long-term, super-established relationship that Heidi was in. She and Carrie had only been dating since that summer. But they were already fighting all the time, and those fights got pretty bad. Just super loud, super disturbing, not only for Jason, but also for his kids. It was kind of the definition of a toxic relationship. Heidi and Carrie said that they were in love, but that they unfortunately just had a really bad way of showing it. And like Heidi, Carrie had also been in some trouble with the law before, hence the mugshot from before. Now, these charges weren't for anything super serious. It was stuff like disorderly conduct, things like that. But still, it wasn't the sort of thing that Jason wanted around his kids. So between that and these constant, constant large arguments that weren't dying down at all, Jason finally kind of just said like, look, you can stay here until you get things figured out, but please, no more having company over, the fighting's gotta stop, like, it ain't working for me. Now that might have been a little bit of an overstep if, say, Jason and Heidi had been traditional roommates or if this was your standard landlord-renter situation, but from what I can tell, and in all fairness, and I could be wrong, it doesn't sound like Jason was even charging Heidi for rent. She was staying with him completely for free, or maybe potentially paying a very small, small, minuscule amount, which was mostly just, I don't know, symbolic in nature, I don't know. But basically, Jason was doing Heidi this huge favor by letting her stay somewhere that should have been pretty much completely out of her budget, since remember, she was living at that motel right before. So he had a right to set boundaries in all of this and say, no more, my house, my rules, whatever that might look like. So Heidi agreed to his rules, and she said that she wouldn't have Carrie over anymore or anybody else for that matter. However, that was very short-lived, because she quickly fell right back into the routine of having Carrie over, not only over, but also to spend the night. She would also have friends over all the time and was just kind of completely disrespectful of Jason's one and only rule that he had for her. She just wouldn't listen. But Jason worked long shifts, and he didn't even realize most of the time that Heidi was breaking his rule, which meant that she was pretty much just getting away with it, at least as long as she and Carrie weren't fighting and catching his attention on the rare occurrence that he was home at the time. Well, on October 19th, 2021, Heidi realized that she was about to get into some trouble, majorly, because every now and then Jason would drop by her floor of the house that she was on to make sure that everything was clean, that everything was in good condition, but her unit was very, very dirty, and she also had been breaking all of his rules. She knew that Jason was supposed to come by and that he wouldn't be happy with the state of her living space. She also knew that she couldn't clean up everything on her own. 
So Heidi decided to reach out to a friend of hers from a construction job that she had worked named Cynthia. Heidi knew that Cynthia would be willing to help given her situation, especially because Cynthia was pretty hard up for cash at the time. In fact, she also didn't have a home. So when Heidi asked her if she could come over, help her clean up, and added that she was willing to pay Cynthia for her time, it really was a no-brainer for her. Now, this was all in spite of the fact that Heidi kind of came across as pretty suspicious from the moment that she actually asked for this favor. She just showed up out of the blue and offered Cynthia a job. And Cynthia noticed right away that Heidi had blood on her shoes, and she was also carrying a gun on her. So she thought that it was kind of weird, but she didn't really think much more about it. But it seemed like maybe there was a red flag here. Like, why is she showing up all of a sudden, asking me to come clean her home? She's got blood on her shoes. She's holding a gun. She's offering me money. She seems a little, I don't know, desperado. But hey, I need the money. She's kind of a friend and acquaintance. Let me go help her, right? I mean, nothing majorly outright crazy. So Cynthia went back to Heidi's place to start cleaning. But guys, she really had no idea what she was getting into. Because when she stepped inside, first of all, she was immediately hit with like this disgusting foul odor of dog poop. And the apartment was trashed. I mean, to say it lightly. I mean, it was, the word trash really doesn't even begin to cover it because the place was just sickening. There was clutter everywhere. There was mold. There were bugs. Heidi's entire half of the house was just disgusting. It was hard to imagine any person even living like this. And in one area, there was a rolled up blanket with just clothing piled on top of it. So, so high. Carrie, the boyfriend, was there with Heidi and they kept describing it as the Christmas tree, this area with all of the clothing. And I'm not sure why they called it that because there didn't seem to be a tree there. I guess it's because the clothing was piled up that high that it almost looked as tall as a tree. I'm not really sure. But either way, this like tree and this clothing pile, it smelled really, really terrible. And Heidi kept telling Carrie to keep their dogs away from it multiple times because clearly there was a lot of odor coming off of it and the dogs went around sniffing it, trying to check it out, you know, like dogs do. So now upon seeing the condition of this place, Cynthia understood why Heidi wanted, well, I should say needed some backup to tackle this mess. But before the two of them even started to clean, they ended up smoking meth with Carrie. Now, this wasn't unusual for Heidi or Cynthia. They were friends. They had both done some drugs together before. I guess maybe they wanted, I don't know, a pick-me-up or a high before they, like, went to town scrubbing down this filthy pigsty. Who knows? But they decided to smoke a little and then get to work. So after Cynthia took a couple hits from the pipe, she began to clean. She and Heidi hit the front rooms of the house first, and while there, she couldn't help but hear bickering between Heidi and Carrie. Pretty standard, right? I mean, she was also in the same room as them for the majority of the time, but the fight kept getting worse, and it was now starting to turn ugly. And Heidi and Carrie didn't even seem to notice or care that Cynthia was there and she was overhearing all of it. She was hearing all of their dirty laundry, and I guess quite literally, seeing their dirty laundry. So finally, to cool down a bit, Heidi decided to go get some food and some cigarettes from the store just to get out, have a little breather, take a little her time. After a little while, Heidi came back, but she didn't have any food for anyone and she also didn't have any cigarettes. So I'm not sure where she went or if maybe she just like hoarded it all for herself, but either way, Carrie, who was already annoyed with her, got even more angry. So the two of them picked right back up where they left off, just started fighting. And I definitely don't think I need to say that this was super awkward for Cynthia. Their argument was kind of all over the place too, but it eventually shifted focus to a missing car key. Carrie thought that Heidi had the key, but she said that she didn't. He didn't believe her, and he said he wanted to strip search Heidi for this key. Then he said to her, quote, I'm going to smash your head in like I did earlier. Which I gotta just say, can you even imagine how uncomfortable Cynthia must have felt in that moment? I mean, nothing is more awkward than being in the same room as a couple who's fighting, and I'm sure she probably thought, like, no amount of money in the world was worth being there at that point. But then to hear how it was escalating, to hear how bad it was getting, and not only that, but being in the house that was just so, so gross. I mean, understandably, she wanted out. She wanted to get the heck out of there. So Cynthia said that she wanted to go, but Heidi turned to her and said, that isn't a good idea. So in that moment, Cynthia's stomach, it just completely dropped. She knew something was weird here. She knew that the whole vibe, the energy was off, but now Heidi's telling her it's not a good idea for her to leave. And then Carrie took Cynthia's cell phone away from her. He was afraid that she was going to call 911 on him. So it was like something was starting to unfold right out of a horror story. It was like she couldn't do anything to stop what was coming next. 
and that she couldn't escape this house of horrors, this terrifying situation. But then, after a little bit of time, Carrie gave Cynthia the phone back, as long as she promised not to use it. But then later, Heidi and Carrie caught Cynthia using her phone in the bathroom. So, they took it away again. Now, I can't blame Cynthia for trying. I mean, who wouldn't want to be calling for help in that situation? They're not letting you leave. You realize that this situation is getting dangerous. Anybody would want out. And at that point, Cynthia felt trapped. It felt like she had no choice but to do whatever Carrie and Heidi were telling her to do. And one of the things that they told her to do was they had ordered pizza earlier, and Carrie told Cynthia to go sit on top of that Christmas tree, that pile of clothing, to eat. She did what she was told to do, but she felt like it was kind of odd that he would want her to sit there out of all places. And then while she was sitting there, eating, minding her own business, she heard a woman's voice. It was coming from a back bedroom. And the woman sounded like she was in distress and she kept asking to use the bathroom. Now again, this was just adding to the complete horror show. It was terrifying. But Cynthia was also scared herself and she didn't feel like she was in any sort of position to do or say anything. So she kept sitting there. And then when she reached down, she felt something human-like in that piles of clothing. Inside that pile, what she was sitting on. Inside that Christmas tree pile. And when she looked down, she finally realized that it wasn't a Christmas tree. It wasn't a Christmas tree standing or wrapped, covered in clothing or wrapped up in a blanket. It was actually a cold, dead body. So in that moment, Heidi and Carrie, they realized that Cynthia had discovered the dark secret that they had been trying to hide, the one they had been trying to clean up around. Cynthia stood up and she started screaming about finding a body. But at that point, Carrie just pushed her down into a chair and he told her, you know, you better listen to me. You better shut up and you better listen to me. He also yelled, everything is going wrong, as though it was some master plan and they're hitting all these like speed bumps along the way. And Cynthia wasn't going to wait around to just find out any more about what this true horror show was. So she just took off. She ran. She got out the door. She hid in Heidi's van. And I'm not sure why she didn't keep running unless she thought that one of them would come out with a gun and shoot her while she was halfway up the street. But she hid. And I got to say, that is a fair thing to worry about because she had seen Heidi with that gun earlier. So she's hiding. And right away, Heidi came outside to look for her. And when Heidi opened up the door to her van, Cynthia quietly opened another door, just sneaking out, trying to go undetected. And she escaped. Heidi had no idea that Cynthia had even been in there or that she had left. And after some searching, she just kind of gave up and went back inside. So Cynthia was still running down the street, trying to put as much distance between herself and that house as possible. And finally, she noticed an Indiana State Police car. And inside of it was an off-duty state trooper. Now, at that point, Cynthia actually had an active arrest warrant out for her, but she didn't even care. She was panicking. So she told this officer what she had found at Heidi's house, and she begged for him to come and help her. Luckily, the officer believed her, too. And it would have been very easy for him to just, like, look at this dirty, unhoused woman with this story that sounded, frankly, mental, crazy, and figuring that she was just making it up or hallucinating. But instead, he believed her, and he decided to call in reinforcements. It only took a few minutes until around 11 p.m. that night, and Heidi's home was now surrounded by police officers. They shouted at her and used microphones to make sure that Heidi would hear their voices from inside the house, and the police were demanding that everybody in that house, they needed to come out, and they needed to come out with their hands up. And luckily, someone listened. In no time at all, somebody did come out peacefully with their hands up. But it wasn't Heidi, and it wasn't Carrie. It was Jason. Heidi's friend and landlord. Jason was fully cooperative. He did everything that the officers were asking. He backed out slowly, put down the bottle he was carrying when they asked him to, crouched down on the ground, and that's when the police explained what was going on here. Because frankly, he had been completely clueless up until that moment. Remember, he had separate entrances. He was on a whole different floor. He told the officers that he had been sleeping this whole time, but that he got up to use the bathroom when the sirens, the lights, the loudspeakers were all signaling that something was wrong, that something was going on outside. He also said that his children were still upstairs sleeping, and he didn't want them to have to come out until he was out there and knew what was going on, knew that it was safe. So then, a little while after that, Heidi finally came out of the house, and the police searched her and they found a gun in her pocket. Now, as for Carrie, it seemed like he was staying put inside but the officers could see him peering out of the doorway. They told him he needed to come out, but he refused. There was a little bit of back and forth, but then finally, after about four minutes, he stepped outside. But he didn't do it peacefully. 
Carrie came out in a shooter stance, kind of cocking what looked to be a gun. And then as soon as the police saw it, they instantly shot Carrie multiple times. They hit the windows, they hit the house, they hit everything, which is terrifying because if you remember, Jason's kids were still inside that house. They were still upstairs sleeping. Carrie was pronounced dead right away. And when the police took a closer look at what they thought was a gun in his hands, it was actually a selfie stick and he had bent it into the shape of a gun. This led them to believe that Carrie probably wanted to be shot to death because, I mean, there was no other reason for him to pretend to be armed and dangerous if he really wasn't. He must have decided to get shot on the spot rather than go to prison for whatever they were about to catch him doing or catch him having done. Well, once Carrie was down and Heidi was in custody, the police officers figured that it was safe for them to go inside. So first, they checked on Jason's kids and they confirmed that they were okay and then they brought them out to safety. Then they went into Heidi's level of the house, and what they found was not so safe. Inside, they found a woman tied up and shackled in the bedroom. Now, this must have been that woman that Cynthia heard begging to go to the bathroom earlier. Luckily, she was still alive, but she had a visible wound on her head. The woman was 42-year-old Amanda Seabee. Shortly after rescuing Amanda, the officers had to get a search warrant to go through and look through the rest of the house. When they did that, they eventually uncovered what Heidi and Carrie had been trying to hide in what they had been referring to as that Christmas tree area. It was Amanda's boyfriend, 50-year-old Tim Ivy. Tim was dead, and it wasn't evident right away how he had died. But whatever the cause of death was, the officers knew that it was a very, very gruesome. As it turns out, Tim had actually been restrained, duct-taped, strangled, and beaten to death. So now, I mean, the police had a lot of questions. Namely, why did Heidi and Carrie bring Amanda and Tim to their house? Why did they beat Tim? Why did they imprison Amanda? And how did they do it? Well, after Amanda received medical treatment at a local hospital, she told the officers everything. She said that she and Tim had been dating for a little over a year. They were now at a stage of their life where they had older children from previous relationships, they got along great, they spent every day together, they were inseparable, and they did everything together, and I do mean absolutely everything. So on the 19th, which was close to a week before everything went down with Heidi and Carrie, Amanda struck up a conversation with Heidi on a lesbian dating app called Timey. Heidi was actually the one who reached out to Amanda, and Tim was okay with Amanda going on this dating app because he liked to join her in these encounters. Like I said, they did everything together, including sexual escapades. Meanwhile, Heidi had used dating apps with Carrie a couple times before so that they could meet people for sex because they weren't exclusive and they also weren't monogamous. But weirdly, when Heidi was messaging with Amanda, she said that her boyfriend didn't want them to hook up. Which is weird because if you're not going to be meeting up and dating people... Why even log on to the dating app in the first place? Why reach out? And why would she keep talking to Amanda beyond a quick like, hey, it's not going to happen after all, but thanks anyway, thanks for the conversation, that kind of thing. Instead, they kept chatting for a few more days. And then Heidi told Amanda that she had broken up with her boyfriend, but she hadn't. She was still with Carrie in real life. But she kept piling on the lies one after another, saying she was really interested in meeting up with Amanda for sex. And Amanda, of course, I mean, she seemed to be down too. Amanda also said that her partner Tim would be there to watch and maybe even participate in it. Which, I can't emphasize this enough, I know I've said it before, but Amanda did not go anywhere without Tim. But this wasn't just for a kink thing for them. Amanda also didn't feel totally safe meeting strangers for casual sex, so she liked having Tim there to help protect her. And of course, like any couple who's still in that honeymoon stage of their relationship, she just really liked spending time with him, even if that time included having sex with somebody else, which, again, to each their own. It's all personal opinion, right? So in addition to talking about what role Tim would play during the sex, there was also some back and forth negotiation between Amanda and Heidi about what they were willing to do, what their boundaries were. So they kept talking, they kept going back and forth, and then they worked out all of the specifics. And finally, Amanda said that she and Tim were coming over to Heidi's place. This was at 4 a.m. on October 19th, 2021. When they got there, the three of them started drinking, they started doing some meth, just partying, hanging out. But as she was telling all this to the police, Amanda was very careful to mention that even though some of the timeline from that night was still a bit mixed up in her head, she still remembered almost everything. Everything in like crystal clear detail. 
Amanda said that the meth didn't affect her memory whatsoever. So then she said after they were finished with the partying with the drugs, they decided to have sex. However, while all of that was going down, all of a sudden, Carrie just came flying into the room like a bat out of hell. He was absolutely furious to see the three of them in bed together. He flew into just this indescribable rage. And he was especially mad that Tim was there. So he got a baseball bat and he started beating Tim. I mean, beating Tim, beating Amanda, and just like going to town with it. And right away, they were beyond bloody. Then, with Heidi's help, he restrained Tim and Amanda with Velcro and with duct tape. Tim started fighting back, and it ended up taking both of them, both Heidi and Carrie, working together to be able to tie him down because he was strong. He was resisting it. He was fighting for his life, quite literally. Amanda told the police that she didn't know who did what, whether it was Heidi holding Tim down while Carrie put the restraints on him, or if it was the other way around, or maybe they were each doing a little bit of everything. But either way, both of them were working together to get him all tied up. And actually, there had already been two pairs of restraints attached to the bed before Tim and Amanda even came over that night. It was unclear whether or not those were set up ahead of time for the purpose of restraining Tim and Amanda or not, or if they had been used maybe in a previous encounter. But after Tim and Amanda were completely tied up and couldn't get away anywhere, Carrie began assaulting Amanda in a sexual way. And then he beat Tim even worse than he had before. And Heidi was actually yelling and encouraging Carrie through all of this, giving him permission to do whatever he wanted to Amanda. Which was pretty surprising, because up until that point, Heidi hadn't really been acting like she wanted to hurt Amanda and Tim. But now, she was totally on Carrie's side while he was attacking them. So, it didn't make any sense to Tim or Amanda. Heidi even told Carrie to do all of the different things that Amanda had previously said she was uncomfortable with. All that stuff that they had talked about when they were first having the conversation on the app about their boundaries. It was like she was literally egging him on to make this assault as horrifying and as personally humiliating for Amanda as she possibly could, as doing everything that she had said she did not want to do. And I have no idea what exactly these things were because they weren't made public, but what made it even more sick and more twisted was that Heidi was getting excited about it. She almost seemed thrilled to be shouting out all of these vile things for Carrie to do to Amanda, as though she was getting off on Amanda being tormented, being assaulted, being hum humiliated. It's horrific, honestly. It's so disgusting. And remember, it's not like there was any option for either Amanda or Tim to try to escape and run away. Because the whole time, Heidi was standing over them watching with a gun, threatening that she would kill Tim and Amanda if they tried to fight back or ever tried to escape. She also said to them, I know someone in Indianapolis who knows how to get rid of a body. So as scary as that was, Heidi and Carrie also started threatening Tim and Amanda's families. They took both of their phones, they went through them, pulling up people's names and addresses, making this big show out of everything that they could figure out, like how Amanda had a teenage daughter. So on top of all of the physical abuse, they were now also psychologically torturing them as well. Amanda was so tightly restrained that she could barely even move a couple of inches in either direction. She was trapped with nowhere to go, and she had to spend every single minute wondering whether or not she was going to get beaten again, if she was going to get harmed in a sexual way, if she was going to be killed. And then a few hours went by, and Heidi ended up leaving the house for a little while. While she was gone, Tim tried to escape, but unfortunately, Carrie noticed this, so Carrie started kicking him. And keep in mind, he was wearing steel-toed boots while he was doing this. But Tim just didn't lie there and take it. He fought back as hard as he could, which unfortunately wasn't that successful because, remember, he was still tied up. And Carrie could move freely, so he was getting angry that Tim was fighting back, so he decided to grab a belt and he strangled Tim to death with it. Then, once Heidi returned from wherever she went, she found Carrie wrapping Tim's lifeless body in a blanket. She said she could help move the body to somewhere else in the house and that she would help out with this, and so that's when they decided to create this, like, awful Christmas tree area together. At that point, Carrie and Heidi didn't know what to do with Amanda, though, so they just left her in the room, tied up. And then that's when Heidi reached out to Cynthia to have her come over to help clean up this entire mess. So once the police learned all of this from Amanda, they ended up sitting down with Heidi. They wanted to get her side of the story. She admitted that she had been using dating apps before with Carrie and that he encouraged her to do this, but for whatever reason, he, she says he wasn't comfortable with her having Tim and Amanda over when he was working and when he was out of the house. 
but for whatever reason, she ignored him and she decided to have them come over anyway. Heidi said that she drank alcohol, she used drugs, all with Tim and Amanda. She also said that it felt pretty awkward when they first arrived, so she took a shower while Tim and Amanda were just hanging out in the living room. But then she said after she got out, she asked them if they wanted to have sex, and they said sure, so that's what they did. Which I don't really know if this is how it always goes with swingers, if it is just so casual and it's very matter-of-fact, very transactual, maybe it is, or maybe if it was different because it was more of like a House of Horrors drug den situation here, I'm not really sure, but it seemed kind of like a simple exchange. And then from that point onward, Heidi's story was pretty much the same as Amanda's, other than one not-so-minor detail. She said that while she helped Carrie kidnap Tim and Amanda, it wasn't because she was into it. In fact, she didn't want to have anything to do with the violence, according to her. Instead, Heidi said that she was afraid of Carrie. She knew that he could become dangerous and that he could become violent whenever he didn't get his way. So when she was egging him on and acting like she was into the, this assault and that she wanted him to do all of those things, she said it was all an act. It was her way of keeping Carrie happy so that she could stay safe. And in fact, a few times when he seemed like he was going to lose it and do something really, really dangerous, she said that she did what she could to calm him down. And she reminded the police that she wasn't even at the house when Carrie killed Tim. But apparently while she was out of the house, he did call her to let her know that he had killed Tim and that there was a lot of blood. So then the police asked her, okay, well, why didn't you call the police at that very moment when he called you? She was out of the house. She wasn't in any sort of immediate danger. She didn't need to worry about keeping Carrie happy. So why go back to that house? Why help him clean it all up? Well, Heidi then broke down crying at that moment. She was sobbing and sobbing. And it was hard for the officers to understand exactly what she was saying through all of the tears, but essentially she just repeated that she was afraid of Carrie. She said she had this love-hate relationship with him and she didn't know what to do. Then at one point she said, quote, There are a lot of things that I should have done differently. I'll say, I'll say. Then she went on to ask this officer, You think I'm just the same as Carrie? And the officer replied, I think you're just as responsible as him for the crimes that happened in your home. And let's be honest, the officer had a really good point. It really didn't matter whether Heidi was the one who actually choked him to death or not, because she did absolutely nothing to stop it from happening. I had two knives I know for sure that he didn't know I had. And then the gun, because he was just in the van, I was trying to leave him. The tire was messed up. I don't have candy on. Okay, he well, was... I am going to search you. You've already had a gun on you. Just... And now you're going to be in this room. So if you want to be out of these cuffs in this yeah, room... I understand. Well, so okay, with so you, Amanda, and Tim, one of you guys was taking pictures while, while this was going on? Um, Who was taking the pictures? Um, I believe it was Tim. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm sorry. That's okay. You now, were you up. guys in the middle of yeah. doing your sexual stuff when Carrie came in? Yeah. Okay, and he got pissed off. Yeah. What did he do? Then. Um, well, like I said, he started, he, he had hit him, he had hit her, and mm -hmm. he, um, then he, uh... And you said hit, was his hands, fists? Um, he was using different things, like he... Weapons? What, yeah. I mean, what? Um, um, I can't remember, I just remember seeing his face, it was just like, and it was... Whose face? Terry's. Okay. But so he gets mad, and he... Uh, what kind of weapons did he use? You said he used so a baseball bat. Okay. Um, and he, on both of them? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, so what happened after? You know, he hits them with the bat a few times. And he's just really flipping happened. out. Like, he's got this crazy rage look. Mm -hmm. um, and it's... If, if, I feel like it was, I mean, this is in the morning time, and um, I'm trying to just calm him down, you know, just, uh, and he's, uh, he ties them, I don't know why I can't. You said you sort of tried to stop him from, from beating them. Yeah. Did you call 911? No. Did you try to at any point? I, no, I didn't even say nothing to him about it, no. Okay. No, this uh, man's threatening my kids. Like, did you tell him, did you, I mean, did you tell him to stop? Did you yeah. try to, like, physically make him stop? To the what, best that like, I'm able to. Um, 
I was yelling at him, um, trying to grab his arm. I remember the last real attempt besides, no, no, it's not the last real attempt because there was times where I literally, um, I stood in, like, I, and I also thought that I was bringing comfort to these women as this was going on, that um, they seen that I'm standing up to him, you know? Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to, t- ooh. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, but uh, the one in the very beginning of all this, this is you're referencing towards, um, I, me yelling at him, um, and, uh, like, I, I, I just remember I, I tried to grab his arm, and he, like, just, like, he reared back, and I just seen this, like, crazed animal look in his mm-hmm. eyes, and, and I mean, man, it's, it's crazy. When Tim's being taped up, Amanda's being strapped into the restraints that you guys already had in the room, uh, did you help him in any way? Um... And I think to a certain extent, like with them, I I did because I didn't stop it, you know. I didn't I didn't gravitate. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, I guess because um, um, I I didn't uh, I didn't stop him. Right. I feel like I did. Um, did you ever, other than like when you guys were having sex together? After that, did you ever put your hands on Amanda or Tim in any way? Uh, did you help put her in the restraints? Mm-mm. And then did, did you put tape on either one of them? Mm-mm. No. No. But um. Okay. Did you put no. any kind of like plastic he, over Tim's head? No. No. Oh. Did he do that? Yeah. Um. What plastic? There was a Spider-Man thing. Um. That he had covered him with. Mm-hmm. Um, Spider-Man thing. He peed on him. Okay. Did he ever do anything to her? Yeah. What did he do to her? Oh, he did sexual things to her. Um, mm-hmm. he, he hit her. Um, he talks a lot of crap. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. Did you ever make any threats towards either one of them? No. Like verbal threats? Um, did you I, do anything to them? Um, no, I, uh, I basically, um, I don't know how to say, like, um, when he was doing things, I basically, like, um, I wouldn't say reinforced it, but it's like, you know, he's, like, um, but I, I was, uh, I didn't show him when, when he was doing it, I didn't show the motion, like, um, I was trying, those times where it's like, um, at first I, I was just, like, um, I didn't stop it, I tried to, but then I didn't, um, I could have, I, out of fear, I feel like I could have done more, like, I could have tried to grab, you know, something from him or hit him, um, but, um, no, um, um, but he, uh, I acted like I was with him at certain points, but then as soon as he wasn't there, then I would try to calm her down. I mean, did you ever encourage what he was doing? Mm-mm. No? I mean, did you ever join in in, like, making threats to them to kill them? No. Or do anything to them? No. Did you, like, tell Amanda or Tim that you were going to help get rid of them no. at some point? Did you tell them anything about being able to get rid of their bodies or anything no. like that? I, I don't know anything how to get rid of a body. I've never been in a situation like this. Okay. Did you tell them anything about knowing somebody that could? No. Did you tell him anything like that in front of them? Um. Yeah, at this point, the, the Tim's body is wrapped up and it's got stuff on top, like, in, in, right there in my fucking dining room, mm-hmm. you know? My dog was laying on top, like, mm-hmm. all this curious to time, like, it's a fucking couch, and he mm-hmm. kept making threats that he was going to show me and, um, the shorter girl, um, Cynthia, um, anyways, uh... He's making threats to do what? To show us his body. Okay. I mean, I had seen him drag, I mean, pull it, like, like, um... Oh my God! Did you help him move the body out of the? No, room? I was there when he did it. Right. I, I was in the, the fucking bedroom, like right. when the, his body was there, like just sitting there, right. having to walk past it. I've never had to do something like that. Did you help him move it? No. Are you sure? I'm sure. So I'm I sure was, wrong, was it wrong? Beaten and tied up and girl in front of you. Yes. Yeah. You didn't think to call nine one one while you were going? I, I did. That's why I was trying it? to. That's why I was trying to. Um, Talk to her, like um, you know, make hints at it. You know, I was, I, it was right, it, it, like I was trying to call nine one one, but not being the one that called nine one one. Why not? Because you then it would, huh? You could have called. Why not get her out of the house completely? 
Because the, uh, what, what's going to happen is, while well, I'm trying to do that, that's why I, I decided that I might have to kill him. Mm-hmm. Do you know how hard of a decision that is? To, I love him. I hated him. I wanted away from him. He was abusive. Mm-hmm. I know. Um, like I said, on my birthday, he, 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 um, he did a bunch of bad shit and broke my, like, it just, mm-hmm. um, anyways, uh. Have you ever called us before for any of the stuff he's done? No. No. Ever tried to file any charges against him for anything? No. no. Um, Why not? Um, because I didn't feel like it was going to help. So how, oh, how did you find out that Tim was dead? He told me when I was on the phone. Okay, and what did he tell you happened? Um, did he tell you how he did it? He didn't tell me. He didn't tell me, but he said that um he had done it. And you said earlier he said something about his bare hands? Yeah. So what did he tell you? Um, he he didn't go into detail, okay? Well, that's a detail right there. Oh, well, that is right. detail, but um, he said with his bare hands, and I knew he had blood all over his pants. Uh, that, like, um, there's blood everywhere, okay? And he was in the middle of cleaning it up. It's like a fucking bloodbath. Mm-hmm. And when it was just her and I had asked um, how, I said, did you did you watch what happened? And she said, yeah. I said, why didn't you close your eyes? And mm-hmm. What did she say happened? Um, she said something about him beating him and then something about, like, strangling him with something. So there's some things that Amanda told me. Spent some time with her at the hospital. There's some things she told me don't exactly line up with what you're telling me. About what? About what went down in the house after Carrie came in. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, like, you helped restrain her. You helped tape up Tim. Uh, you encouraged him while he was with her. I encouraged him? Yes. You okay. had You had a gun in your hand in that bedroom threatening both Amanda and Tim, uh, you told them that you knew people in Indianapolis that knew how to get rid of bodies and that you guys were going to kill them both and get rid of them. She saw a gun in your hand. Uh, you helped, you did help move Tim's body from one room to the other. Uh, I acted like I was going to, this is after he had had sex with me, okay, and I, I that's why I don't have hands on, okay? Um... I said I acted like I was going to. Okay. okay. What about the other stuff? I mean, her saying that you helped tie them up, that you helped restrain no. them, that you and helped that them I encouraged him to. Okay, I did him my fucking self. That you had to go to, in that room and made threats to both of them to kill them both. That you prevented them from leaving. Yeah, eventually I, you took the restraints think, off. I think. Um, but I think he, uh, the way she tells it. You were a lot more involved in what you're telling me here. I'm a, I'm a lot more involved. Like, yeah. like, how would I be a lot more like involved? What happened in the room? Like, like, I knew that he was going to come in and do that shit. Maybe not that, but that I mean, you were involved wait. in but, uh, with the holding them captive and restraining them and being a party to all of this stuff that happened in uh, the room and making these threats I, and having I, the gun I, in the room. What does it benefit her to make this stuff up, though? You know what I mean? She just got beaten and watched her boyfriend get murdered all in front of her today. I know, that's what I So said. why would she just make stuff up about you if it didn't actually happen? So she was, so what is the, like, what is she saying that I, what is she? She's saying that you helped him. That I helped him? Yes. No, I didn't help him. But you helped like, him. But, no, I didn't, like, by restraining her. Yeah. Okay, now, the Answer. threats, um, the threats, like I said, when I was trying to put the redirected or whatever on from her to him, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, I did do, okay? What do you mean? Like, what? what oh, my God. Um, yeah, but does that make me a guilty person, a guilty party? Like, I'm some fucking predator that I'm going to just sit here and beat and rape people? Mm-hmm. That you, that's the whole fucked up situation, okay? Who had the worst end of it? Amanda. Okay, her boyfriend, he's dead. He, he's done. He didn't have to fucking deal with that shit. Mm-hmm. Amanda, okay? Um, if that was any part of running any of the shit that happened, I wouldn't have stopped him from doing it. You say you never had the gun inside the house. No. Okay, that's one thing I still don't understand is why she would tell me that you did have the gun, and that you were making threats that both of them were going to die. If you were playing along with him, like you said, sure. But I mean, why would she tell me that you had a gun? He he 
he had the gun. He had set the gun down. I had not had the gun. I did have the gun, you know that. Um, but um, that I don't know. Um, why would she say that? What, did you, what else did she say that was fucked up? That um, okay. Um, I'm sitting here. And I'm going to be honest, without being offensive towards you, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm in a very fucked up situation, okay? And I feel like you're coming at me like I'm... And when all I've done was try to keep myself alive mm -hmm. and keep two women alive, mm -hmm. okay? Um... I can be a very violent person, okay, mm -hmm. um, if somebody does something wrong. I can be. Mm -hmm. I, these people didn't do anything wrong. Right. Did you in any way have Amanda and Tim over there to have sex with them knowing that Carrie was going to come in and catch you guys? No. Like to piss him off? No, 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 no. If you guys have been fighting or no. whatever... Was it a, a thing to just make him mad? No. Yellow? Did you see what happened? No. No. no right. Can you tell me? Or should no. I might not be able to handle it? I mean, we ended up having to shoot Carrie because he had something that looked like a gun. You killed him? Hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our officers did. Okay. So. That's, um. He came out, had what looked like a gun in his hand, and wouldn't put it down. So. Um, I'm. Honestly, I. I was thinking about killing him myself, like, and that was a fucked up thing for me mm -hmm. to have to... <laughs> I, and Ultimately, I think that Amanda has no reason to lie in any of this, okay? She went through a lot yeah, she did. today. She went through a heck of a lot. Yeah. She's now, you know... But don't tell me something that's going to... Please don't. What? Oh, I think you're going to tell me something. Like, so, I don't know. No, I'm... I just said... She's lost her boyfriend. Okay, yep. Right? She was beaten. She was raped, Right? I don't think that she lied to me about anything. She was very detailed. She was very open. She was very honest about everything that happened, in my opinion. And I believe what she told me. Okay? I and believe that you helped tie them up or bind them up. I believe that you had that gun in there and made the threats that they were both going to die. I believe her when she tells me that you told them that you knew people they could get rid of their bodies and all of those things. I, 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 I believe I you that. her when she tells me that you had a much bigger part in all of this than what you've told me. If that's the case, then why would I do the things that I was... That's, but what did that, you do? You did that, nothing to help them. In the beginning, I mean, because... He even said, because I didn't, I did nothing to help him. No, okay, so, okay, if I saw an opportunity to keep myself alive, okay? Mm -hmm. You left. You were gone from there. And I tried. You could have called now. And, and, and you know, if I you wanted, could have done a million different things to get help. So you're saying I him. did the same shit as him? I'm, I'm, what are you saying? Yeah. You think that I'm, I'm just the same as him? Maybe not the same type of person. Well, no, but then, then, then wait, you're going to help somebody because I'm trying to keep myself alive? Started. For the crimes that took place in your oh house, my God. you are just as much as responsible as he is. Absolutely. 100%. You are completely um, as responsible as That's what you as fucking think? Absolutely, that's what I think. That's what I know. Based on all the evidence that we have. I okay, so I'm done. Unless you have any questions or anything else you need to add. All right, if I'm okay. just as guilty, why... I'm not, you're not my judge, you're not my no, you're not. jury or nothing, okay, but... But I'm the one responsible for investigating this, and that's what I've done all night long. Okay. Okay? From every angle, I've looked at this and talked to everyone that was involved, other than Carrie and Tim, because they're both dead. I can't talk to them, right? So with that being said, Heidi was arrested, and she was booked into the county jail for charges of murder, two counts of intimidation with a weapon, assault in a sexual way, two counts of felony criminal confinement, assisting a criminal, carrying a handgun without a license, and for abuse of a corpse. But given all of the excuses that Heidi had given during her confession, 
the police knew that they had their work cut out for them if they wanted to prove in court that she really was responsible and not just intimidated into helping Carrie. They also needed to determine whether or not the kidnapping and the murder was planned or not. I mean, Amanda and Heidi both said that they scheduled their meetup for a time when Carrie wasn't supposed to be home. So the question was whether or not he got back early and actually surprised Heidi, or if she always knew that Carrie was supposed to get home. And this was all sort of scripted in advance. When Tim's autopsy was released, it was an exact match for what Amanda had said. He had been strangled to death. But then in a weird twist, the month after her arrest, Heidi's felony murder and assault charges were dropped to accessory to murder and accessory to assault in a sexual way. And this was because the police determined that she helped Carrie facilitate everything, but she didn't actually do the killing or the assault. So not as serious as her original charges, but still serious enough to get her put away for a very, very long time if proven guilty. Heidi's trial began at the end of November 2022, and unfortunately, no cameras were allowed in the courtroom, but a lot of the reporters gave pretty detailed accounts for what happened. Not surprisingly, Heidi's defense team made an argument that matched up with what she told the police. She was one of the victims in this. She wasn't the killer. They said that the only reason that the state was even going after Heidi was because they wanted someone to blame for Tim's murder. And since Carrie, the real killer, was shot to death by the police, they were now trying to pin this whole thing on Heidi instead, or as they put it in their opening statement, because he is dead, because he was killed by the police, the state of Indiana had to choose their perpetrator, and that is Heidi Carter. The prosecution's team's biggest piece of evidence against that argument was having Amanda go on the stand, give her description of what exactly went down that night, and she did not shy away from getting into every horrifying graphic detail. And when she talked about getting hit with that baseball bat, she said that it was the worst pain that she had ever been in. It was sheer, blinding pain. I feel like Amanda's testimony was also crucial for the prosecution. She had nothing to lose by telling the truth in all of this. I mean, she was honest about everything. She didn't hide the fact that she was doing meth or anything else about it. She just spoke about her experience, truthfully and freely. And Cynthia, that friend of Heidi's who came over to help clean, also talked about everything that she had been through. But the jury was made aware that Cynthia did have prior convictions for fraud and for false informing, and that she was currently incarcerated on a theft charge and waiting for her trial to begin. So there was a little bit of a room for debate about how credible she truly was. The good news is, on top of the witness statements, the courts got to see over 120 pieces of evidence, including that baseball bat that Carrie used to beat Tim and Amanda with. They also saw body and ring camera footage and Heidi's two-hour-long interrogation during which, I should mention, Heidi claimed she didn't have a gun on her in the bedroom like Amanda said she did. The body cam footage also showed officers going into Heidi's home to rescue Amanda, who was just completely freaking out and sitting in this pool of blood. It also showed Tim's body, and when that came up on the screen, Heidi couldn't even stand to look at it. She just ended up looking down at the floor. And that's on top of the fact that she was already pretty fidgety and nervous throughout the entire trial. So Heidi's lawyer advised her not to take the stand, so she took that advice and she just sat there and stayed quiet. There was also footage of Amanda's interview from her hospital bed, during which she said that it was Carrie who held a knife and a gun up to her face, not Heidi. Now this contradicted what she had said during her testimony on the stand, which could just be a result of Amanda being confused after all of the traumatic things that she went through, but it wasn't a great sign about her credibility. If she misremembered that detail, she might have misremembered other details as well. On December 1st, after 12 hours of jury deliberation that went in well into the night, shockingly, the jury came back saying that they could not reach a unanimous decision. And when asked if they needed more time, the jury foreman said, I don't think that that would be helpful. It was a total shock to everyone, especially given all of the evidence that the prosecution team had. But like I said, there were issues with different witnesses and how reliable they truly were. There was really no easy way to know what was going on in Heidi's head and to tell if she had planned anything in advance or if she was only helping Carrie because she was scared. It was truly a tough thing to decide. So a couple of months later, in February of 2023, Heidi's retrial happened. The lead prosecutor on the case told the jury, I believe the only question is going to be, did Heidi help him? We argue she did. But again, the defense was sticking to the story that Heidi was a victim, and they labeled her as an easy scapegoat and said that it was actually Carrie who was the guilty one. Now, a lot of that trial was just a repeat of the first one, but I did find something interesting that happened on day one. 
The defense lawyer actually said that Heidi was trying to help Amanda while she was held captive. The lawyer asked Amanda about food that Heidi gave her, clothing that she gave her, and other things like that. And Amanda said, yeah, she said that she was going to get me out of there, but we'd have to kill Carrie first. Amanda also said that Heidi told her while she was trapped in that bedroom, I'm not going to let him hurt you anymore. So now, looking back at all of that, in hindsight, Amanda told the lawyer that she felt like Heidi was making empty promises, especially because she never once tried to actually stop Carrie through all of this. In fact, she helped him. But again, it was all a very gray area, debates about what Heidi could have been really thinking. Was she truly scared? One witness was a forensic scientist who described the testing that they did on Amanda after the attack that she survived, and the analysis showed moderate to very strong evidence that Heidi's DNA was on Amanda. But the problem was, Amanda had already admitted that she and Heidi had originally been participating in this consensual sexual act together. I mean, that was the entire purpose of Amanda and Tim coming over in the first place. So it shouldn't be all that surprising that Heidi's DNA was found on Amanda. Because of that, it was basically impossible to prove if Heidi had harmed Amanda in a sexual way after everything that they had already done that was consensual. But there was also evidence, nothing super concrete, but some evidence that Heidi's DNA might have been on a bungee cord and a bloody rag that had been on Amanda's neck. In fairness, the crime happened in Heidi's house where she lived, so there were some innocent ways that her DNA could have ended up on that. But the prosecution also showed the jury a bunch of Facebook messages, which didn't really prove anything, but it also didn't make Heidi look good either. I mean, not to say the least. In some of the messages, Heidi would go on and on about her violent fantasies that were sexual in nature. She talked about wanting to act out her desires with somebody for real in these fantasies, and it was something that was really on her mind and something that she hoped to find somebody that was down to do it with her. At one point, she also took a selfie while she was sitting in a car with a bunch of handguns on her lap. And I can't help but wonder if she used that same selfie stick that Carrie had bent so that it would look like a gun. Just a little detail that was on my mind. Either way, the picture was incredibly helpful for the prosecution because the gun in that selfie matched the description of the gun that Amanda said had been pointed at her. The police hadn't been able to find the actual gun, but these pictures was the next best thing in terms of proving that it existed and that Heidi had access to it. So after a relatively short trial, the jury deliberated for seven hours. The prosecution team was starting to get nervous that they would have another mistrial or that justice wasn't going to be served for Tim and Amanda. But then finally, the jury came back a little after 8 p.m. saying that they unanimously agreed that Heidi was guilty on all charges. And that next month in March, Heidi had her sentencing hearing. This was when she finally decided to speak up, and I guess she was now looking for the judge to take mercy on her. She doubled down on all of her earlier excuses too, saying that she wasn't a monster, she was just a victim. She said, yes, I was living in sin, but did I commit any crimes? No. Under the circumstances, I did the best that I could. I'm a victim too. I don't think that the judge was swayed, especially because he also heard from Tim's children who didn't have a father anymore and now had to move forward knowing how truly brutal his last moments on earth were. Tim's daughter said in her victim impact statement, the only man to truly understand me is gone and it feels like most of me went with him. I will never understand or recover from this. Just a truly heartbreaking statement. Heidi ended up getting 65 years in prison for all of her charges combined. And because she had already had time served, which was about a little over 500 days, it wasn't much to shave off, so she'll be spending the rest of her life in prison. She does seem to be cheerful, though, even behind bars, because she has quite the profile on a little website called meetaninmate.com. Her profile also says she isn't sure when she will be released, so I don't know if that means that the last time she updated it was before she got her sentence, or maybe she's hinting that she thinks she'll get out early on parole, or maybe she's planning an appeal. Who knows? But here's a little section from her profile. Spunky, fun, and full of fire. Loves to text and talk and write. Does yoga and works out every day. Has a colorful sense of humor and loves to laugh. Likes things that are interesting and loves to learn new things. Identifies as a Christian mystic. Believes in God, but also in the tarot, psychic readings, and palmistry. Loves to talk dirty and is a very sexual person. This girl has a very strong personality and loves a challenge. 
Now, guys, not only is that like kind of cringe to me, but I'm also so curious who actually writes to people on these sites because I know people do. Like, what kind of person does that take? Anyway, Amanda was happy that Heidi was found guilty and that she didn't get labeled as the victim because she also didn't buy that story for a single second. She needed to pay for her part in it because she was acting like she was a victim and Tim was the victim. I um, you know, I was the victim, but... She wasn't in, in any sh way, shape, or form a victim. In fact, usually victims who are assaulted in a sexual way aren't named in these types of cases. But Amanda wanted to come forward so that she could really share what went down and make sure that Heidi was punished. And like I said, she was really open about her experience and almost matter of fact about it, which is pretty impressive when you think about everything that she went through and how it changed her life. I met her on a, a lesbian dating app. Um, and we were trying to arrange to get together. I mean, it's not anything we hadn't done before. She says Hammond was expecting Carter to be there with another woman when he arrived home from work, but Ivy was an unexpected guest. He knew that it was happening. He knew what was going on. He didn't know that Tim was there. He wasn't supposed to be there. Um, but I didn't go anywhere without Tim. That was, you know, that was part of the how we kept ourselves safe. He strained us right after, um, right after they hit me on the head, and right after they they restrained us immediately. So, um, and they were already put in place. The restraints were already attached to the bed where they put the two on one post and two on the other. So, like I said, it was planned because they knew already what they were going to do. He fought to the last breath. Um, when Carrie came in there and was kicking him, he, it was like he knew it was his last chance. And he, I think if he hadn't been already duct taped the way he was, he could have overpowered him because he, he fought like hell to try to get, get him. It takes a minute for me to even trust you at all, you know. Um, I don't leave the house much. Pretty much changed my entire life, how I do things or how I look at situations, how I look at people. I'm also really glad that Amanda didn't have to go through all of that recovery after the attack on her own. She told the press about how her daughter had been right there by her side the whole entire time for her. She said she went through it with me. When I came home, she went through a little trauma and we've had to come back and try to figure out how to do it together. I don't know, I spent the last year and a half so focused so much on the trial that I don't know exactly what is next. Amanda's also in a new relationship as of now. Now, this entire case really surprised me from start to finish. I feel like it escalated so, so quickly. Like, how did this seemingly nice middle-aged couple get mixed up with this violent meth addict couple? And I know you're rolling the dice whenever you do use a dating app, but this? I mean, nobody expects a one-night stand with strangers to turn into this disgusting house of horrors with torture, assault, murder, all of these things. And I also wonder, if they didn't get caught, would Heidi and Carrie have gone on to become serial killers? Like, they wouldn't be the first couple to go on this killing spree basically out of nowhere, right? But let's be honest, they did such a bad job covering up the first murder, so I would believe even if they did try to get away with it and go further on, they would have been caught sooner or later either way. That's just my personal opinion. I mean, also, why would Heidi have invited Cynthia over to clean when she not only had a dead body in the living room, but she had Amanda still alive in the bedroom who was talking out loud? But then I can't help but wonder if they just planned on killing her too once they got the house cleaned. Maybe. Maybe that's why they had refused to let her leave and took her phone. Who knows? Maybe her life was spared by, like, a stroke of good luck. I'm also curious if any of you actually think that Heidi was actually the victim in this situation. If Carrie hadn't been shot and killed, would Heidi have gotten off on a lesser charge like her lawyer said? Let me know what you guys think about this case, and if you're happy with the outcome, let me know in the comments below. Thank you guys for hearing today's case and listening to today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss future episodes, and thank you again. Until the next one, stay safe.